This is the Manfred Vogel Memorial Lecture. I am Ken Seaskin, the Interim Director of the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies. Uh, at this point in time, the Crown Family Center is a well-established organization. Uh, we have taught courses on ancient Judaism, medieval Judaism, early modern, modern, contemporary. We've covered Judaism in the Middle East, Europe, North America, South America. We've done sacred literature, Bible and Talmud. We've done uh, film. We've done secular literature. Uh, and we've done similarly with uh, uh, Israel. We have uh, done the economics, the sociology, the political the theory of modern state of Israel. We have uh, done Israeli film, Israeli poetry, Israeli literature. Uh, we teach three years of Hebrew. We're considering a fourth, God willing. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that it wasn't always that way. When I was an undergraduate, uh, I enrolled in a course that Fred offered on modern Jewish thought. Uh, <laughs> philosophy major, I was burned, thought I was hot stuff. Uh, at this point I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Hannah Zucker-Seltzer, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Hannah. Hey, um, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce um, Naomi Seidman. Professor Seidman is uh, the Jackman Humanities Professor at the University of Toronto in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora and Translational Studies. Previously, Professor Seidman was the correct professor of Jewish culture and the director of the Richard S. Dinner for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Um, in 2016, Professor Seidman was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship um, which is, um, um, for those who are less familiar with it, it's a very prestigious award um, given annually to people who have demonstrated, this is I, I um, uh, quote, demonst demonstrated exceptional capacity for productive scholarship or exceptional creative ability, and I think Professor Zeidman um, actually embodies both. Um, Professor Zeidman's writing is diverse. She has written extensively about various topics such as literature and secularization, translation studies, psycho psychoanalysis, um, Eastern European literature and culture, Orthodox Judaism, religion, gender, and sexuality. She wrote books that have tremendously enriched the knowledge and research of many scholars and the white public alike, um, and one which are marriage made in heaven, the sexual politics of Hebrew and Yiddish, um, faithful um, renderings, Jewish-Christian difference, um, and the politics of translation. Um, the Marriage Plot, or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, wonderful title, um, and a Revolution in the Name of Tradition, Sarah Schneer and Beis Yaakov, um, and The Navel and of the Dream, Freud's uh, Jewish Languages, which is forthcoming, um, and Gender and Remaking of Modern Jewry. Um, this is part of um, uh, the Cambridge History of Judaism um, volume. Um, and her fourth book, Sarah Schneer and the Beis Yaakov Movement, a Revolution in the Name of Tradition, won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies in uh, 2019. Um, and if you're interested to learn more about her fascinating project, uh, you can find more information um, in the website, um, thebesyaakovproject.com. Um, and I would also like to note that Professor Zeidman um, is um, she has a podcast on leaving the ultra-orthodox Jewish world, her, and it's called Heretic in the House. Heretic in the House. Uh, it was recently released by the Shalom Hartman Institute. I know some of you already mentioned that they are listening to this podcast. It's fascinating, so um, highly recommended. And, and just a personal note: I had the pleasure to be Professor Zeidman's uh, student, uh, where I did I did my PhD. Uh, at the joint doctoral program at UC Berkeley and the GTU. Um, and I must say, it was a great, great privilege to be your student, Nomi, to work with you. 
uh, I learned so much, um, not just about the field, which was fascinating, always uh, inspiring, but also uh, a lot um, about just kindness and generosity. So you will always be my model for a professor and a human being. Uh, on this note, I just want to um, invite you and to hear your wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really very generous introduction. And it's so wonderful to see you here and to meet your colleagues and friends and fans. If you don't know Hannah Zucker Zeltzer, I hope you soon will. Um, she's teaching Hebrew and language and literature now, and Northwestern is really lucky to have you. And um, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you for, I don't know what, what strings you had to pull to make this happen, but. And also, thanks so much. I'm having such a good time here. And uh, Nancy, this was such a well-organized visit, and I know it was probably frantic at moments behind the scene, or maybe not. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm staying at the Hyatt House. I just want to move in. I want to live there. Um, and I also it was wonderful to meet Ken Seaskin, who, what a moving introduction you gave um, and it's to, to this lecture title. And it was great having dinner with you last night. And I wish I didn't have to go home tomorrow. Okay, so. The Freudian Lullaby Contest, um, which can help me come up with that title. So we're not going to start with the Freudian uh, Lullaby Contest. We're going to start with, I think, um, the attitude that people have about psychoanalysis and Eastern European Jews, which is, as you can see, psychoanalysis was the disease of assimilated Jews. Your Eastern European Jews may do with diabetes. That's the <laughs> satirical journalist, Karl Kraus. I actually suggested that we call this psychoanalysis for diabetics, but <laughs> Ken Seaskin thought that would just be a little too confusing. Um, and Karl Krauss wasn't the only person that thought that psychoanalysis and Yiddish-speaking traditional Orthodox Eastern European Jews was not a natural match, um, because uh, that's a, a, a photograph of Max Eitingan in the bottom left, who unfortunately just made it into the PowerPoint, but didn't manage to make it into the title. But he's the founder of um, he's the founder of the what was first the Palestine Psychoanalytic Society and then the Israel Psychoanalytic Society. Himself of Eastern European Jewish ancestry and a member of Freud's inner, inner circle, which was basically comprised of Jews like him. Um, and his he wrote. Um, in a letter back to Freud in 19, he, he made it to Jerusalem in 33. He was the director of the Berlin Psychoanalytic a Polyclinic, um, which was a, a kind of free clinic or sliding scale clinic. He was a socialist and also very rich, okay. often goes together. Um, and he, uh, in his case, he wrote back to Freud that Jerusalem is wonderful. He was a Zionist and, you know, he loved the smells and all that um, in Jerusalem in the evenings and the summer evenings. But he just felt that in moving to Jerusalem, he had landed among um, a population of Orthodox Jews and Palestinians. Neither of him seemed like we're really going to pick, you know, take him up on the offer of being psychoanalyzed. <laughs> so he wasn't sure how psychoanalysis would do in Jerusalem, but apparently it still exists. Now, there were exceptions to that rule. And one of the most interesting exceptions, you, I can see Barry from your face that you know about this. Did you guys publish? So recently there's been a discovery that actually, a, that the Rebbe Rashab, who's the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, um, I believe, Sean Dover Schneerson, actually was treated by one of a psychoanalyst in Freud's inner circle. He was actually Wilhelm Stekel's first um, patient. It's not entirely clear that that it was the Rebbe Rashab who's referred to in a case study. You know, these case studies generally they um, obscure who, the names and the. But we do know that he came to Vienna to be treated um, for paralysis of the right side, which actually was Anna O's, if you know psychoanalytic history. Same problem there. And somebody told him about a neurologist named Freud. Um, Freud also worked as a neurologist throughout, um, you know, even after that. This is 1904. Um, and uh, Freud um, passed him along to Stekel, if indeed it is uh, the Rebbe Rashab. 
And my thought was that it's very possible that Stek he was passed along to Stekel because Stekel actually grew up in the town of Boyan, which for some of you who know um, East European lore, Boyan is the center of the Hasidic Boyaner. It's, it's a, it's the, the, the main industry in the town is Hasidism. Mm -hmm. The Rebbe lived there, that's where his court was. There's no doubt that someone who grew up in Boyan knew Yiddish. Um, in the case history, it's not described as Yiddish, it's described as a broken German mixed with other languages, but what, that's what they thought Yiddish was in those days. So maybe that's why um, Stekel's first patient was, a, at least in a different little pond, was a superstar. Um, too, too bad we don't have more of the case notes, maybe they'll turn up. Okay, so um, despite this general belief that Orthodox Jews or y Yiddish speaking working class Jews and psychoanalysis didn't mix, and this, which I've already given you one exception, but he's an exception. He had, you know, a rich Hasid who paid for his travels around um, to the spas, you know, it was a full time job being an invalid back in those days, the spas and the neurologists and all that. So, you know, a rebel would have a rich who paid for all that, so he clearly had the means. But the general feeling was that for the Eastern European Jews, psychoanalysis was, you know, very interesting maybe, but it was a, basically a fancy thing that was for other people. Um, that was the feeling. Um, but it's also the case that, at least in the Yiddish press, um, people were really interested in psychoanalysis. And here's the title of the talk. The, the Promised Freudian Lullaby Contest. Let's see if I can, I can probably read it here. One good contest deserves another. I forget what the previous contest was. I should have looked that up. A prize of 15, count them, $15 will be paid for the cleverest Freudian lullaby for a Jewish baby, etc., etc. So there's the Freudian um, Lullaby Contest. As you'll see, this is in English. Um, this is the English page of the foreword. So the forward had an English page um, because, um, as I'll explain a little bit more, a lot of their, if some of the, the stuff on the English pages is directed toward children, and some of it is directed toward new immigrants trying to improve their English that were, you know, they would try a, a, for a page or two, they would put up with some English. So this particular lullaby contest, which as you can see, August 17th, 1930, got over 1,100 entries from all over the world. Um, and um, there you can see the winner. A lullaby contest won, and there, the, for the younger members of the family, lullaby contest won by David Greenberger. There's the winning, uh, I think that's the whole thing, um, the winning uh, uh, lullaby. But there are also other lullabies um, that were published underneath, and um, also the following week. So someone should write a whole book about what is a, a, a Jewish lullaby, a Freudian lullaby, and let me show you a little bit. Here's, uh, um, I actually didn't really think the winning, I would not have given the winning lullaby prize. I thought this one was pretty amazing, that was very, very long, and I only chose a little piece of it. So it starts, it's, it's Milton Dickstein, and he clearly knows psychoanalysis very well, so that's one thing that we could figure out is that there were readers of the foreword who really, first of all, his English is kind of amazing, and his knowledge of psychoanalysis is really amazing. And the, the way the, the lullaby starts is um, the mother is saying to the child, um, let me sing of, of trees and tinkly tunes and little bunny rabbits, and the child says, no, um, said the, the child, really annoyed, sing to me the epic of Freud. So um, this is one little piece of it. Um, maybe I won't do the whole thing, but some of it, so you get the feeling. Sing in soft numbers of sonorous tones, the findings of Breuer and Dr. E. Jones, of Martin and Rivers and Professor L. L. Hollingworth, 
and Mrs. M. Sanger, who writes on controlling births, you'll make, me an you'll make an edifice of me yet if you hold me so close, says Dr. Jeanette. <laughs> I know it's Jeanette, but you need to say Jeanette. You're looking at me like, here's someone who doesn't know French. It's true I don't know French, but I know how to pronounce Jeanette. But clearly, you have to say Jeanette for the rhyme. Um, you know, etc. Jung is in there, Ferenzi, Brill. This is somebody who himself could be writing the book that I just tried to finish. <laughs> so, um, and the punchline is that the the mother falls asleep, right? Because this is a very pedantic baby that goes on and on and on. So I think part of the joke is the joke that the tired person is trying to get the wide awake person to go to sleep. It's an old lullaby joke, um, but you know there are other possible jokes in it. Let me show you uh, this one. I'm not going to read uh, uh, just little pieces of a few others. Sleep you chazer, don't you know? I want to see a movie show. If you sleep, I'll buy you toys like you saw by Levy's boys. <laughs> so this one's a little bit different. I mean, and it's um, in this one, it's, uh, the, I guess the joke is, this is actually uh, something that people say about lullabies, is that often the tune is relaxing, soft, but the lyrics are actually murderous, right? <laughs> um, well, and so that you're, you, you have to accomplish the effect of getting the baby to fall asleep, but you're also doing the other effect of you know, describing how much you wish this child would disappear so that you could have a life, or at least be unconscious. And um, uh, I'll just point out a couple things. So this this combination of aggression and um, I don't know niceness. See how this is Freudian, um, but also what's interesting is the role that Yiddish plays in this. So this so the 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 sweet part. I mean, there's also the role that Yinglish plays, right? Like you saw by Levy's Boys is, like, I, I still have friends who say that, right? I went, uh, I'm sleeping by my mother tonight. Have you heard that? And some of you from Brooklyn there? So, um, that, so that's a kind of immigrant English speech, but also Chazer, the insult, right? The Yiddish insult, which um, uh, Yiddish plays the role of let's call it the id, right? This is an old joke, the id as id. It actually goes back to Ernest Jones, in case you think it was a Jew that came up with that one. Um, so the, the role of we're the not so polite emotion, um, how, that's, how that's expressed is in the Yiddish. So Yiddish is, uh, especially in relation to high languages like Hebrew, um, Yiddish plays the role of the deflationary, right? In Hebrew, you know, Jews are the chosen people and have these great comments. And then in Yiddish, we know that they're schleppers. So, you know, the, the perfect, uh, the, the example that Benjamin Harshav gives is, B'makom she'enish is a fila herring a fish. In a place where there is no man, even a herring is a fish. So it, it moves from the high Hebrew in a place where there is no man, to even a herring is a fish. Low expectations, realism. This is the role that um, Yiddish plays. So one of the strange things, you can see there the Freudian lullaby on the right. Um, so the Freudian lullaby is a little break from the forward's general educational tone in this, these English pages. It mixes jokes with um, learn English better, you immigrants. So. This, in other words, this whole page sends a very complicated mixed message. Lillian Eichler on the left is saying, don't permit your child to acquire a foreign accent or intonation. Grammatical speech, absolutely essential. That's true, however you say that. Baby talk, mm -hmm. conversation at home should not consist of idle gossip. We might say, and don't curse your child in Yiddish <laughs> while you're trying to get them to fall asleep. Um, I think she does more or less say that. And then on the right, the winners of this contest are finding public, I mean, this isn't the grand winner, David Greenberger, but I think the better lullabies are, not, are getting published in the forward on the same page as the, people, as, as the etiquette expert, Lillian Eichler. So um, I think what, if you want to talk about some kind of Oedipal complex that plays itself out on these pages, 
So we have the usual Oedipal complex. People, you know, don't often talk about that, um, or maybe they do, the hostility of parents to children. I mean, that's how it all starts, or at least maybe let's call it the tension between parents and children. But there's also, in the Oedipal story, is also a kind of displacement, and right? Oedipus is banished um, uh, because, so that he doesn't kill his parents. So, so there's a way in which the story of Oedipus and, um, and his parents is also a story of immigration, a story of uh, the kinds of displacements that might happen in a family in which immigration and also linguistic difference in this case is an issue. So we have a sort of complicated um, drama, family drama, um, that is a complicated family drama that's, that, that is hypercharged with the issues that Yiddish-speaking parents have in raising English-speaking children. So um, not that Freud actually talked about this, but that's what plays itself out on the pages of the forward, unconsciously, I would say. <laughs> I don't think they realized they were sending this double message. Okay, so who was Freud in the Jewish press, in the forward and various other places? So first of all, you have to understand what the, Jew what the Yiddish press was in these days. So in the 20s and 30s, which is the period in which Freud appeared in the Yiddish press regularly, um, the Yiddish press was an international network of newspapers which included at least 50 Yiddish dailies. Um, dailies, um, in 50, over 50 in Warsaw, New York, lots of other places. Um, there was just an explosion of the Yiddish press in this period, um, and which basically meant that, and the Yiddish press, I think as you can see, had two, two, two jobs. It had to entertain, um, ergo, a Freudian lullaby contest, and it had to educate Lillian Eichler. These were the two things, bring Jews into the middle class, teach them about things like, right, the bit will brief, you're supposed to say excuse me when you bump into someone in the street. Um, it, it was supposed to kind of civilize the masses and entertain them at the so same time, um, educate them. Um, Freud was perfect for both of these jobs. Um, Freud was both, Freud himself wrote complicated theoretical texts that only people with real educations could understand. But he also wrote for the masses himself. He gave public lectures. And a lot of the things that he was saying could be basically explained um, to the masses. And it was about sex. So it was obviously entertaining. Um, but it was also difficult. So it also made people feel sophisticated. So Freud was just, you couldn't live without Freud. Whether, it didn't even matter if you were for Freud or against Freud. It worked, but it worked fine either way. And that's why you find, okay, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just the, um, in the Yiddish world that was exploding with these uh, presses. It was also um, English language material. This is not from the 20s and 30s. This is from now. I just took this picture because um, I was looking for a picture of Freud and uh, Einstein. Because Einstein and Freud were very often featured in the Yiddish press and often together. So, for instance, Verzen and Hein, die berühmte Jeden auf der Welt. Who were the most famous Jews in the world? This is everywhere. You, somebody could write a book just on the famous Jews in the world in the Yiddish press in the 20s and 30s. Um, I told you, they had to fill their pages. Mm -hmm. And famous Jews were what the masses wanted to hear about. So Freud and Einstein were everywhere on all these lists. This, the one that on the right there is from the Pinsker Express. So this is a daily in the town of Pinsk had this. But it wasn't just, um, the New York Times, by the way, also had that. In the New York Times, the, the list of 10, the 10 most, it wasn't always 10. Sometimes it was like 15 or 50 or whatever. Um, the New York Times actually Lewis asked Lewis and Lewis and to, who, I'm sorry, Ludwig Lewison, is that his name? The novelist, to come up with the most famous Jews in the world. And he came up with a list, and he divided the list into the true luminaries and then the second ranked ones, who were not, didn't have the same divine spark, I believe he said. And um, uh, 
uh, Stephen Wise, who was a rabbi in New York, um, who was on the not so sparkly part of the <laughs> list, um, objected to this list because it made no it made distinctions between sparklier and more more and less brilliant Jews, but it didn't make any distinction between good Jews and bad Jews, by which he meant Jews who you know belong to a synagogue, I guess, um, and they got into you can. Google 10 most famous lists, and this is in the new pages of the New York Times, big arguments about what these lists should consist of, of the greatest Jews. So it wasn't just the most famous Jews. Oh, and I should say also that Freud and Einstein knew that they were on these lists. I have evidence because um, Ernest Jones, uh, Freud's biographer, main biographer, um, writes that in, on, on Jan, in uh, around New Year of 1927, um, when Freud was visiting his son in Berlin, someone told him that Einstein was visiting his son, also in Berlin, two blocks away, and that the two most famous Jews in the world should meet each other. So uh, Freud told Jones, Einstein understands as much about psychoanalysis as I do about the theory of relativity. So we had a very pleasant afternoon. Um, later, they, they, they actually met in a more substantive way. But there was a difference because Einstein, you start talking about Einstein on the pages of the Yiddish press and, you know, theory of relativity, E equals MC2, and then you've, there's, there's really not that much you could say beyond that without losing your audience. So, um, <laughs> there's Freud, um, you know, you can, you can certainly find more to say even to uh, a, a, an audience that can't even dream of ever seeing a psychoanalyst personally. So as I said, this was an international phenomenon. Oh, I didn't tell you about Samuel Goldwyn. So Samuel, the New York Times really so eager to put Freud in their news stories that they, um, Samuel Go Goldman, an uh, American film producer, had, I think it must have been a publicity stunt, that he was going to hire uh, Freud for, I don't know, a million dollars? I, I forget, some big sum of money that goes in a headline. And to come to Hollywood and write a film that would be the greatest love story ever told <laughs> that only Freud could tell. And the New York Times followed Goldwyn, basically, Goldwyn set sail from New York Harbor. <laughs> Goldwyn arrives in Vienna. And then, unfortunately, <laughs> Freud wouldn't even meet with them. I, I don't understand why, but OK. So back to this. This is Buenos Aires. Um, um, this is the Yiddish Daily in uh, uh, Buenos Aires. And there you have das Unterbewusstseinige und sein Roll in unser psychische Leben. I think this is the front page. Yeah, it's the front page. Um, and this is uh, 1924. That, that date there is, is the date of its founding. Um, uh, and it says there was a, a, a talk, a lecture held in the, um, by Dr. Polina Rabinovich um, in, about, about the unconscious. So um, 1924, between 1924 and 1925, in this newspaper, um, and not even the whole year, just the print run that I found uh, on the, um, the online, there were, uh, I think there were 11 um, uh, articles about Freud in just this one Buenos Aires Yiddish paper um, in the space of less than a year. And um, to me this is very interesting because, so you're probably all thinking, if I can read your minds, which of course I can because I've been studying Freud. Um, so um, you're probably thinking, well, Buenos Aires, of course, right? You read about the history of when did Buenos Aires become a psychoanalytic city, you will read that it began in the 1930s. So in the 1930s, um, Argentina, discovered psychoanalysis, and you look at the names of who these doctors and psychiatrists were that were the earliest groups of people who got together to read and to translate Freud into Spanish. They're the children of immigrants, um, in the Yiddish, of Yiddish-speaking immigrants from Eastern Europe. Um, and, you know, so all these, I, I, I think that if, if there's one little piece of this research that I'm presenting, 
I've discovered why it is or how it is that, psycho, that psychoanalysis actually dates back to the 1920s. The, the fascination, the craze with psychoanalysis in Buenos Aires dates back to the 1920s and the historians just don't know about it because it's all there in the Yiddish press. Um, why, why Buenos Aires was so interested in psychoanalysis? We can psychoanalyze a city, lie down to uh, Buenos Aires. It might have something to do with their feeling of being marginal to the Yiddish-speaking world and wanting to ride the current of um, the most interesting and exciting things happening in the world. But I don't know. That's just a guess. Um, okay. So one of the things that I, I've talked about the press. So certainly by the 1930s, Freud was everywhere in the Jewish press. He was a famous Jew, you could read articles about him, but part of this culture of the newspapers was also the culture of lectures. So um, as you saw, Polina Rabinovich, they were reporting on a lecture that was given by this doctor who had probably come from Europe, um, I mean, I don't know if she had immigrated, um, on psychoanalysis. So there's a kind of international network of lecturers. These are just lists of lectures, and the, I'm going to point out, they're all interesting, but I'm going to point out Dr. Avram, it turns out his name is Glixman. Um, there he is. And here's, and th this is just, you know, if you want this person to come to your town, contact them and we'll send a lecturer. I guess that's like me. Die Macht von Liebe und Geistige Leben, Theoria, Professor Freud. So number one on the list, and by the way, these lists are everywhere, and it, his always starts with something with Freud. The power of love in spiritual life. So obviously, who doesn't want to hear that, right? Um, and then he, 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 was, he was good with the title, not as good as Ken, but the Freud und ihr ewigen Sod. Woman and her eternal secret. <laughs> Call them up. See how the religia dem moderna mensch gornish mountsuzogen. Does religion have anything more to say to modern man? Baruch Spinoza als geistiger Führer. Okay, you see this guy's taste. Who is Glixman? We're lucky because. Um, there's more information about him. I don't know all these people, but I found a nice little bio of Glixman. Um, I mean, I saw him everywhere. I knew he was lecturing and writing about uh, psychoanalysis in the 20s. This is from 1926, I believe, this particular list. So he, uh, Glixman came from a Hasidic family. His nickname, you know, surprise, surprise, his nickname um, uh, was the Eternal Student. Mm -hmm. um, he moved to, uh, <laughs> I used to make a joke when I was a graduate student that I was a gradual student. So <laughs> I could have said I was an eternal student. I don't know what you saw here. So he moved, his, his wealthy Hasidic family supported him. He's going to Europe to get an education. Fine, great. He was there for 19 years. <laughs> he, <laughs> he studied political economy, philosophy, um, uh, sociology, and then after 19 years, 1920, they cut off the funds. They're like, you need to sign, and you're coming home, and make a living, figure out how to make a living. Okay, that's what he did. Figured out, he was actually worked as an economist also for the German and English press, including The Economist, which I think still exists. So that's Glixman. He was also known as, a, like, a, I'm trying to think of how much I say in the actual, here's a little piece of, so Melech Ravitch, who makes fun of him a lot, um, Melech Ravitch <laughs> claims that, you know, he would, he, would, he would get a little assignment, this is why it took him so long to get a degree, he'd get a little assignment, write a paragraph on this or that, and he'd come in with a treatise, and the editor, I'm looking at Barry, would have to like go, no, pick out like three sentences of it. He was apparently incredibly long-winded and they would like pull the mic away after like three hours kind of thing. So, okay, when, um, he, uh, that, that's what Melch Roberts says, but here's the thing. When the Freud fashion hit Jewish Poland, Dr. Glixman, Glixman's star ascended with big and small towns literally begging him to grace them with a lecture about the great psychologist. 
Since Dr. Glucksmann, you can hear the tone. <laughs> By the way, Glucksmann died in the Holocaust, and this is 1947, but okay. Since Dr. Glucksmann was even less capable of speaking to a general audience than of writing for one, his popularity began to wane until someone advised him to sprinkle a few jokes into his material. Glucksmann heeded the advice, and the invitations began to flow again. But in one shtetl, the audience found his jokes so side-splittingly hilarious that the convener had to bow, pound on the table, you immature brats, wagon drivers, the professor is providing a serious lecture, and you laugh like impotent school children. <laughs> the room grew, grew somber as a funeral, and no one dared to even smile at any of the jokes that followed. <laughs> So this is, I think, an interesting um, scene, because let's just say that I told you that Freud had the um, advantage of being both entertaining and serious, sophisticated, high-minded, difficult, etc. Um, here, the Yiddish-speaking uh, audience listening to the lecture by Glitzman had to learn how to be entertained without showing it. So, which is exactly kind of the opposite of what psych, I just said that psycho, you know, these are people who couldn't afford psychoanalysis. If they had gone to psychoanalysis, they would be buttoned up German Jews who lie down on the couch and then Freud would say, you have to say whatever's in your mind, you can't be embarrassed, you can't whatever. These Yiddish speak, that's, that's psychoanalysis, right? You can't censor yourself, that's the whole, that's how it works, supposedly. These are people who had to be taught to, psycho, to, to censor themselves. They had to sit there and have the proper decorum at a Yiddish, Yiddish talk. Okay, so um, in the 1930s is when, I won't, this isn't the subject of this lecture, but I'll just tell you that the way this story is often told, just like the way the story of psychoanalysis in, in Argentina is often told, is through the figure of Max Weinreich, who maybe you've heard of, the founder of the Ivo Institute, who himself was a sociologist and, and uh, trained at Yale in kind of a combination of sociology, anthropology, and psychoanalysis with um, Edward Sapir and John Dollar, spent time in the Tuskegee Institute working with um, scholars of African American youth um, and wrote a book about Eastern European Jewish youth called Der Weg zu unserer Jugend, which quotes both the race theory of his time and Freud. Um, it's a fascinating story, it's not the topic of this, but um, himself was a Yiddish nationalist and a, a serious Wissenschaftler, a serious scientist, and I'll just remind you that, you know, the, the insult that psychoanalysis is a Jewish science, um, and that Freud had to say no and had to fight against it, at YIVO, with the uh, uh, Weinreichs Institute, the title of the institute was Yiddish Wissenschaftlicher Wissenschaft, Organ, uh, in Organizatia. So um, in the title of, the, uh, of YIVO, it, co it is called Jewish Science, the Jewish Science Institute, right? So, um, so this is Max Weinreich. This is what psychoanalysis was. This is elite psychoanalysis in Yiddish-speaking circles. But you can't tell that story just by starting with Max Weinreich. Max Weinreich spends the 1933-1934 um, year at Yale um, on a Rockefeller Fellowship studying you know, with psychoanalytically oriented scholars. Um, and then he spends the, uh, the fall of 1934 in Vienna. It's not clear. I don't think he ever met uh, Freud, but he corresponded with him. Freud's health was not good that fall. But he met with other psychoanalysts, and he worked with uh, scholars there. And then he wrote his book, which, uh, Der Weg, which was published in 1935. Then he becomes Freud's translator. So this is what psychoanalysis looks like. And then he's teaching psychoanalysis in his institute. But to understand who, what psychoanalysis was, I think you have to start with how popular psychoanalysis was for, for everybody in the Jewish world, um, along with and how, how they learned about it through these public lectures, through stories in the Yiddish press, before Weinreich started. So, um, and yes, there's also a novel um, uh, by Michael Bernstein um, uh, called by the, by the Waters of, and now I'm forgetting the name of the river, like obviously a take on By the Waters of Babylon, um, in which there's a character who's known as the Freudiska, like the 
the, the Freudian, female Freudian, or is it Freudianka? So it's, and this also takes place before Weinrath's time. So, and we heard there's a, there's a Freud craze. So Weinrath doesn't start psychoanalysis in the Jewish world. He rides an already existing um, wave. And here you can see a little bit. This is Weinrath's article. Um, does it say here, yeah, there, Max Weinrath. Um, Professor Sigmund Freud, der Rinter Forscher von Ge Geistige Krankheiten, wird heint 80 Jahre alt. So Freud's 70th birthday was uh, celebrated in the Jewish press, all over the Yiddish press. By his 80th birthday, it was twice as much. Um, so every, every time he got a prize or came out with a new book, um, it was all over the Yiddish press. And this is probably the most serious um, of the articles about Freud, but it's the foreword, so we know how they treat it. And here you can see, Psychoanalyse, der Mittel zu heilen der Weserkranke, welche Professor Freud hat entdeckt. Okay, so psychoanalysis, the way of treating mental illness that Professor Freud discovered. Um, that's number one, so you know that. Number two, the Schwerigkeiten, the difficulties that Freud underwent because he was a Jew. So um, number two, very important. Freud was mentioned all over, but in the Yiddish press, the fact that he was a Jew and the fact that he was persecuted as a Jew is the second thing you say after he discovered something called psychoanalysis. So it's all laid out very nicely for us. Um, the third thing, um, what is a, a, a mental illness, right? Eastern European Jews, we know about diabetes, but what is mental illness? Uh, and then an interesting case of a young girl um, who had such an illness, the interesting case of a young girl who had such an interest, who's had such an illness, you're still reading, right? Um, and then, and then how, he, how he cured her through hypnosis. Now, by 1936, hypnosis was long not practiced in psychoanalysis, but the Yiddish press was still interested in this. I'll just say a couple more things about this, which is that um, uh, Ab Kahan, the editor of the Forward, writes a kind of warning, it's too small to see, but I remember it, where he says, um, this should not be taken as an endorsement of psychoanalysis. Um, we know that lots of people say it's that psychoanalysts are charlatans, and um, nervous women come to a psychoanalyst and lie down on a couch and talk for six months. That's what he said, six months. Halavai, right? <laughs> um, and this is supposed to cure them. But Max Weinrach, we know, we respect, so we'll let him, we'll let him have his say. So that's, that's what it looked like. Um, during this period, um, Freud joined uh, in which psychoanalysis was being taken more seriously and being given fuller treatment in the Yiddish press. Um, uh, Freud was invited to join the board of the, um, of the institute and he joined along with Einstein. Um, he never went to any meetings, he politely declined. Um, he authorized Weinrath to be his only authorized Yiddish translator. There were two unauthorized um, earlier translations, at least. Um, this was published in three volumes, it was supposed to be six volumes, Rein Theorem Psychoanalyse, Introduction to Psychoanalysis, uh, suitable for a general audience, so even that. There's Weinrath teaching. Um, and in, I believe this is already New York, but he was teaching psychoanalysis in Vilna the, uh, at the Evo, but also in New York at Columbia. Um, and there's one of his students, Don Miron, and I mentioned Don Miron because um, this, is, uh, this is a quote. Miron writes that, that the last conversation he had with Weinreich was about what does psychoanalysis mean in America? Uh, I'm sorry, what does YIVO mean in America? What is the point of my existence now that the youth that I was, that I was investigating and researching are murdered? Um, the YIVO is gone. Nobody speaks English, Yiddish in America. What is the point of the YIVO? And Weinrath said to Miron, 
He said, I don't know about you Israelis, but this I do know. If American Jews still dream as a group, Yiddish is the language they speak in their dream. It's still the idiom of their collective unconscious. For their personality to become whole, they, at least some of them, will have to go back to Yiddish someday. And there we shall be, waiting for them down in the Yiddish cellar with the strong torchlight in our hand. Someone will have to spell out for them the contents of their dream to elucidate the, vi the vision they saw with blurry eyes. And we, because we made Yiddish Wissenschaft the thing we live and die for, will be able to throw light and heal. Um, Yiddishism, this Jewish nationalism, this idea that the knowledge of the part of yourself that we American Jews left behind, forgot, that we only remember a few words that appear in our dreams, the Yiddishists are like psychoanalysts in the sense that they will help us understand what this was. Um, and this is a kind of uh, turning point, as you can see, from Yiddish as, as being the language that we need to put behind us and learn proper English, to suddenly Yiddish being the language that we need to connect with to make ourselves whole. In this way in which Yiddishism and psychoanalysis come together, the Yiddishist is a psychoanalyst. Um, and Freud understood this, and Freud knew this, and it says here, So this is, um, uh, instead of a foreword to the Yiddish edition, because Freud said, everyone keeps asking me for forewords, if I say yes to you, I have to say yes to everyone else. So he wrote a letter, and they published the letter as that, um, and he says, I'm holding, I'm holding your book in my hand, the first volume of, of the Four Lays of Moon, the introductory lectures, um, and I treat it, I have mit Kreisterch Eretz genommen in Hand So I take it in my hands with great respect. Um, that Freud himself felt this kind of respect for this language. He says, I'm just sorry that I can't read it, that I lost. So I just want to point out that, and maybe it's too obvious to say, that Freud himself is one of those people who actually dreamt in Yiddish. If you read the interpretation of dreams, Freud dreams a Yiddish word in, his, in one of his dreams, and he goes to his Yiddish-speaking friends. He, he doesn't know if it's Hebrew or Yiddish, and he has to learn from them what it is he dreamt. And so this, so, so Freud himself has this new kind of relationship um, to, let's see, what time is it? Oh my god, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up, okay, Ken? So, um, so Freud himself is one of these, this is, this is, it isn't just that Freud doesn't know, Freud, Yiddish is something that, 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 that psychoanalysts, that, that those people will never have a relationship to psychoanalysis because they don't have enough status or money or access to its centers. Um, and, it, and, and in this moment, Yiddish and psychoanalysis are coming together in all kinds of, of, of I think, very rich and interesting ways that I'm not going to tell you much more about, except to say, um, well, let me talk a little bit about uh, Judd Teller, who's an English and Yiddish journalist. He wrote for the Monday Journal, which my father also, my father was a Yiddish journalist, so he also wrote when it was the Tug Morgan Journal, when the papers started folding, and you have like two papers coming together. So um, here's an article he wrote for the Yiddish Press in 1938, the Yiddish Kehila and Wien, the state, it's unter Schatten von Hitlerism. So this is uh, the, the Jewish community in, in Vienna, which is under the shadow of Hitlerism. Um, so I guess how they called it then. And he says, it, and he, he talks about his visit to Vienna the year before and how he went from the Hasidic courts three blocks away to visit Freud in his house. Um, and that this association between the Hasidic Rebbe and Freud is made because of the shadow that both the Rebbe and Freud, a different kind of Rebbe, um, are both sharing this kind of Jewish fate that brings them together, at least in the mind of the Yiddish-speaking journalist. And then in a, in a poem, he was also a poet, like it wasn't enough to be everything else. Um, he wrote a poem in honor of Freud's 82nd birthday in 1937, published it in the Yiddish press. Um, I'll just, 
And it's called For, for Sigmund Freud on his 82nd birthday. I'll translate it for you. Um, he saw the saluting hands, right? The hands raising the swastikas. Um, he smelled with his sharp or smart nose the old hateful blood in young <coughs> Arya Shkotsu, right? So, mm -hmm. Shigitz, sh 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 right? A, a young non Jewish Aryans. Um, and then he repeats the word Shkotsu, as we used to say, of Ivris, Yiddish, Yiddish, Habendi. So um, this, this, this word for non-Jews, um, in Hebrew Judaish, or I don't know what to call it, Judeo-German, Yiddish, um, those after whom you are named, right, you, Freud, are named, um, that's the word that they chewed like matzah, um, or kneaded like challah, or um, uh, cursed, like Havdalah. It's interesting, Havdalah, the, the, the ritual of, of separation. Orl, Esav, Goy. He, he puts it in there. This is, he, and he puts these words not exactly into Freud's mouth, but into the mouth of the Yiddish-speaking ancestors after whom Freud is named. So in 1938, the association between Freud, the, the Yiddish-speaking Jews among whom he lived, and his own Yiddish-speaking ancestors, was very close to the consciousness of the Yiddish press. Um, I just have a, a couple more slides. Um, this is, and in, in general, this fascination with Freud's family history was everywhere. So you, ha you see here this frequently produced um, Stammbaum, or Baum, um, of Freud's house, of Freud's family tree, um, and there, which I, is in the Sefer Buchach, uh, Freud has ancestors come from Buchach, which is my father's hometown, so I guess I feel it too. Um, there you can see Yisachar and Freda, um, the ancestors after whom, it turns out, for Yiddish speaker, you're like, Freda, Freud's last name is actually a matronym. Um, he's named after a female ancestor, which isn't that unusual among Eastern European Jewish family names, right? Sorkin is Sarah, Sarah's kid. So this, you know, the, 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 the Jewish mother, the, the mother tongue, even though, you know, this is a, a German family tree, all those associations come together very powerfully. And even his relative, and Freud is in the newspaper, often on the front page, every day in the late 19, after the Anschluss. And even in America, here the forward finds, <coughs> turns out Professor Freud has a niece in Hunter College. <laughs> what she's studying? Psychology. <laughs> We're very worried about our uncle. Yes, I study psychology. I don't really, I don't agree with everything he says, I think is what she says. <laughs> Okay, so the Yiddish press is eager for any kind. It isn't just a story about Freud's end. It's, it's a way in which the Jewish community is feeling its kinship ties to Freud um, through the Yiddish language, through poems about his, his ancestors, through, um, through interviewing his niece. I couldn't actually find a niece with that name in the family tree, so who knows. Um, but this idea of this and projecting all kinds of things onto him, right? There's one newspaper story which says, um, I went to visit Sigmund Freud. His uh, study is lined with portraits of his Hasidic ancestors. I don't think so. We know a lot about that space, but somebody's imagining Hasidic ancestors. So maybe before I, um, should I show you this? The very end of his life, this is my last slide. At the very end of his life, um, Freud is in London, he finally makes it to London. Um, I didn't so much talk about the way the Jewish world went crazy when Moses and Monotheism was published. You can ask me more about that, you know, in the Q&A. Um, but the three representatives of YIVO, 
who have been corresponding, uh, Freud has been corresponding with Max Weinreich for years at this point, since the 1930s. So um, they finally get an appointment with Freud, and they finally came to visit him, come to visit him almost at the very end of his life. And at this point, these three um, Jews walk in, Yiddish-speaking Jews. Freud is thinking, oh, they're going to hate me. Because the Moses of monotheism, so the first thing he says is, do you hate me because of Moses of monotheism? Should I not have published it? And he says, um, and, and this is Steinberg and Maples and someone else whose name isn't mentioned that I could find. Um, uh, they're the sort of board of YIVO in London, they're to pay the man a visit. And they say, you know, chas uh, Wissenschaft is Wissenschaft, right? And so these Yiddish Wissenschaftlichers say to him, you can't, and one of them actually says it in, 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 in halachic language, um, you never change the, rule, the truth, for, you can change what you do, but you never change the facts for the needs of the hour. So they're, you know, they come up with a halachic reason for why, you know, Moses and monotheism is exactly what Freud should have published at that time, and then Freud is ready to have a conversation with them, and maybe I'll just say that Ian Steinberg, there's this uh, photo on, on the bottom right. Um, he was a, a really interesting character, an anarchist, an observant to um, a founder of the Freiland Liga Territorialist, um, tried to find a homeland for Jews in Australia, I think, um, to found a, a, a homeland. So uh, Maples and Steinberg both describe this experience, and Ernest Jones described this experience too. So we have a lot of different uh, descriptions of this meeting, and I'll just read from Steinberg's description. I told him briefly about the scientific work being carried out at Evo, and he expressed his sorrow at not knowing the two languages, Hebrew and Yiddish, which made it impossible to follow what was happening in the Jewish branch of the science. In other words, uh, Freud knew and well understood that there were serious psychoanalysts doing research on Jews um, in Yiddish, um, in, you know, in, in Eastern Europe. And now it would be difficult for me to learn them, he joked. Yesterday I turned 82 and a half. He expressed his willingness to do any, everything in his power to help Yivo. Although I haven't reached the level of the Jews of Eastern Europe, I am still a Jew a godless Jew. I look in your faces and see strong vestiges of my dead father. I don't know how to explain it, but there is a great commonality in our blood. Um, and there's a picture of uh, Freud and his father. Um, whether he looks like Steinberg, I don't know, <laughs> but I think maybe a little. Um, after a decade or two of Eastern European Jews Imagining that they had some special connection with Freud, right? Like, we celebrate all his birthdays, he's Jewish like us, he's persecuted like us. Um, at the very, very end of Freud's life, um, that relationship was turned around, and Freud, um, maybe they were projecting all kinds of things onto Freud, and maybe Freud was projecting all kinds of things onto them. But in any case, there was a moment in which Freud looked at them and he saw himself in their beautiful Jewish faces. <laughs> Questions? Complaints? <laughs> yes? Um, since you brought up Moses and monotheism and I guess totally taboo or whatever, what did the Yiddish press think of his views on religion? So first of all, the Yiddish press was itself really diverse, and Freud, one of the ways, I, I didn't mention this, but one of the ways, Freud kept telling, so there was this weird, um, and, and that's most of the Yiddish press. So the Yiddish press is socialist, anarchist, the Tug was you know, more conservative, and then the Orthodox press basically ignored him until Moses and monotheism, at which point they jumped in. They felt they had something to say. Um, the, Freud kept saying, you know, it's terrible, I'm taking Moses away from the Jews. Mm -mm -mm. No, they're like, uh, 
Sorry, uh, Freud. I think we know the Bible a little better than you. You got this wrong, you got that wrong. Freud need not have worried that any Jew would feel threatened by Moses and monotheism. Many of them were annoyed, but they weren't threatened. Um, and more than annoyed, I mean, the Orthodox press like basically tried to excommunicate him through the press, which, you know. Yeah, Mary. Um, so I, I want to give you uh, an opportunity maybe to connect, um, connect this talk to two other areas. So when I was hearing this talk, I thought it would be an interesting intervention in the work of people like Sandra Gilman, who work on um, the Jewish nature of psychoanalysis as a discipline, and like the way Yiddish is handled in that discourse, which is very different from the way Yiddish is handled in, in what you presented today. So that was one thing I thought. I did not put Barry into the audience to ask that question. <laughs> but the, the other thing is, I think it's also interesting, and I wonder if you've reflected on this, to think about American cultural production. I mean, Phyllis probably wants to talk about this more. American cultural production in, in, you know, in the post-war era, prominent fixtures like Philip Roth and Woody Allen, who are, you know, so the Eastern European association with Freudianism that becomes very explicit in Woody Allen movies, where he, you know, references his own Freudianism all the time, and the fact that that wouldn't necessarily be a natural relationship based on Freud's background as a Viennese, German-speaking, Central European, um, assimilated Jew. Wow. Okay. So on the subject of. Gilman and Boyarin. There's a whole. There's a whole. Uh, my my book is actually now called, in the Freud closet, and um, what I say like on the third page of the introduction is I'm sure you're all thinking it's called in the Freud closet because I'm going to argue that Freud's most secret and denied uh, aspect of his personality is his Yiddish speaking Eastern European um, self which is what Sandra Gilman says and Boyar and a whole bunch of people. I'm like, no, 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 I'm totally not saying that. The Freud closet is the little closet in, off the living room of my house in which I kept all my Freud tchotchkes because when you're writing a book about Freud, people give you Freud tchotchkes. <laughs> and so I had a whole collection of Freud, Freud tchotchkes of the Freudian slippers, the Freudian slips, the Freudian you know, magnets, the Freudian mugs, the Freudian... Um, also my, my Yiddish and Hebrew books. And I, I actually don't buy the idea that Yiddish was some secret thing that Freud had. And the evidence that he was... Even what I just read about Freud saying, um, I feel so bad that I can't read your book in Yiddish. And then to, to Devir Devosis, his Hebrew translator, he said, I feel so bad I can't read your book. And they were like, oh, he certainly could, Gershami. He certainly could read it. How does it even, why would he say? And anyway, he lived into the period in which he saw and was associated with Yiddish nationalism. Not only that, he had, I mean, he clearly had some identification with it. Um, Yiddish was something to be proud of, Derek Eretz. Um, maybe in the very early years, but in the period in which he was engaged with um, his Yiddish translators, who he didn't take any royalties from, unlike his other translators, um, he, uh, the relationship was, was one of open um, respect. And the idea that he was covering over a secret knowledge of Yiddish, I completely and totally reject. I also think it's not interesting anymore. And one of the things I say is that I do a surface reading of Freud's relationship to these languages. Um, I look at them as expressed, and I read him, and I take him. So, so that, that's the basic methodology of my book. So thanks for asking. And it's in argument. It's in an argument with all those people who think that Freud was hiding his Jewish self. I absolutely don't think so. The second question also was good, but what was it? It was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Post-war American cultural production. Oh, the whole, yeah. so that's something I actually wrote about in my third book, which is the one that kind of likes the title of How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, um, where I basically make the argument that even though modern secular literature begins with an adoption of European models, it ends through Woody Allen, um, Erica Jong, uh, Philip Roth, all those characters, with the, and Freud, with the complete overthrow of the old Christian models and the new Jewish models. And the new Jewish models are Freudian, but also, and what they are is 
the models of understanding sexuality that are not covered with a, a kind of sublime Christian chivalric romance, Virgin Mary thing. The kind of the down to earth. The fact that Jews didn't have, I mean, they, they were involved with knights, but at the other end of the spear is how it's described. <laughs> and the idea of a virgin wasn't that appealing or familiar. They're like, why? <laughs> so um, um, the, 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 the kind of the realism, let's call it sexual realism, that's kind of part of Jewish discourse, right? The you know, Talmudic uh, books about menstruation as opposed to virgins, um, that that realism somehow manifests itself, this is the argument I was making, in Freud and then becomes a kind of dominant way in which Jewish writers critique a kind of gauzy Christian influence notion of love to create a contemporary culture, which I think is completely, in this one regard, Jewish. If that, that actually made sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm not keeping track of the order, so who was first? I think you were, right. Well, I, I, ha I have a question and, and a very small observation. And the question is, I was looking at the list of, of these dignitaries that were published in, in Pinsky and Yiddish, I believe? The Pinsker Express. The Pinsker Express. Now, I, Highly I, can, recommended. Understand, I can understand people in Pinsk reading in Yiddish how they could relate to the, these famous figures in, in culture and the arts and yeah. so forth. But what did they make of Felix Frankfurter and, and Louis Brandeis? And he was in that, right? Yeah, they were both in that. So, list, yeah, what, what's interesting is, is Einstein, Freud need no introduction. And then you get like a, a little line on Felix, who was he? He was like a, a jurist, right? Yeah. Sorry, it's Justice embarrassing that I don't know. I should read the Pittsburgh Express. <laughs> so he was a Supreme Court Justice, like Louis Brandeis, who right. was also, and he started a, a college. No, I know he didn't. <laughs> um, so, you know, they get a one line description, and they're educated, and they feel proud. And actually, one of the, one of the um, insights, the psychoanalytic insights that Weinreich uh, brought is that he learned at Tuskegee from the race theorists there, is that um, Weinreich's big argument is that basically the Jewish religion is a compensatory mechanism for Jewish inferiority. So all persecuted minorities have um, need compensatory mechanisms but the Jews have like a very good one. God chose us and all the Nobel Prize winners are, so the more persecution, the more lists of famous Jews. Um, he, and he mentions these lists of famous Jews in his own psychoanalytic. He says, clearly Jews, like they need to read lists of famous Jews. So you don't know who Frankfurter or whatever is, you know, you learn and then you get that, maybe somebody just spat on you in the trolley but you're the Supreme Court Justice, right? Actually, we got three names. Should I say we? Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> three, right? Elena Kagan, or is it still three? Maybe we lost. No, we. Retired. I'm doing the we thing. <laughs> Breyer retired. Yeah. Oh, Breyer, right. Yeah, we lost so we're waiting for the next one. <laughs> um, it, he analyzed this culture of, you know, of. I mean, the, the coffee table books, the bar mitzvah books, where, where would we be? What, where would you give people for a bar mitzvah if they weren't famous Jews? <laughs> and just this idea, the Jewish IQ, the Jewish Nobel Prize, the Jewish whatever. Um, so that's what they get out of it. Yeah. You know what they get out of it because you get it too. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the other observation is that, uh, you know, Celebrating Freud's 80th birthday is perfectly understandable because the what one does at the 80th birthday of a famous person is move the You have to spread the the, the, the ruin. The story is you have to spread the the glories of yeah. their of their of their career. So I mean that's perfectly consistent. What I found very amusing was that the story took precedence over the story below, which was how the recently anointed king of England had a budget of three million dollars to spend for a year. This was a minor, a minor incident compared. It's still how I read the New York Times, right? It's like, you know, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you, you, that's right, that's right. It's like, who are the, who are the famous Jews? 
Who, who, what do we want to read about? What, what, what gets the most clicks? <laughs> what gets the most clicks? It'd be interesting to know if that was still true. Yeah, the King of England, he's interesting, but he's not a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody else have a Yeah. As part of your work, you've become quite familiar with the history of psychoanalysis, I think. And I hope, a little. <laughs> Not as much as Milton Dickstein. With some notable exceptions in American psychoanalysis, there have been few non-Jews who were psychoanalysts. But in the last decade or two, that's begun to change dramatically. So that here in America, there are Indian psychoanalysts, there are Persian psychoanalysts, there are black psychoanalysts, growing numbers from a variety of different cultural backgrounds. It's even spread into countries like China where it's become quite popular. Other e Asian countries like Japan, even a little bit in India. So I wonder what your perspective is on those kinds of changes. So. Um, interestingly, there was, there was psychoanalysis in, there was Indian psychoanalysis before there was Yiddish speaking psychoanalysis. I mean, there were le a few lecturers going around giving talks, but Freud had a correspondence in the 1920s with an Indian a psychoanalyst in India. Um, so people were, I mean, whether he could be called a psychoanalyst if he hadn't been analyzed by Freud, because that was the way you became a psychoanalyst in the early years, but there were people, in other words, Psychoanalysis is, was an international um, movement fairly early, and Freud actually, that was intentional. One of the interesting things about, Freud had this Wednesday evening circle, which was his disciples. There were like five, and then there were nine, and then there were 15, and then there were the secret five. And um, He actually, one of their crazy early ideas was that each disciple would go out and spread the good news throughout the world. Um, there's a lot of overlap between Freud and Jesus in some <laughs> regards. Um, and the idea was to make it to make it international. And then the question, and Freud really thought about what does it mean to translate um, and his to translate, for instance, interpretation of dreams into was translated into Russian in 1905 and then translated into English, I believe, in 1909 by Brill, whose German was probably Yiddish, and he's described as having this, when people in Hollywood try to like, show an, uh, a psychoanalyst, often they give him like a very heavy German accent, like that's the sign of a psychoanalyst, and now we may begin, right, the end of <laughs> Portnoy's complaint. Um, Apparently, Brill, who was the, in, for a while the most famous psychoanalyst in New York, in America, his Yiddish accent was legendary. He was, he was supposed to be like, like have the thickest possible Yiddish accent, like a vaudeville psychoanalyst. Um, why was I see you were, oh, so Freud says, you know, in every place that psychoan psychoanalysis is not, it's not this kind of translation where you just translate it word for word. I give you the method and then you go to America, and then, and then you translate, not my dreams, but American dreams. So if I have a dream about the Kaiser, then you find someone who dreamt about the governor or the president. Um, so uh, how to think about psychoanalysis cross-culturally is, of course, a huge topic. I mean, you know, Fanon, Franz Fanon, uh, uh, Caribbean, East, West Indian, French, Algerian psychoanalyst, post-colonial theorist, you know, the, the, really the founder of that field, he said, blacks don't, can't afford, we don't have the Oedipal complex, we can't afford it. <laughs> um, so this whole question of what translates where is very interesting, but what I'm interested in, among other things, is, and Yiddish wasn't that early, right? The 20s was late to be getting into psychoanalysis, and they weren't that far away. But even though Yiddish is a kind of backwater in the history of psychoanalysis, right? It's, it was never a psychoanalytic society. There's never, first of all, where would you, you know, they're, they're described as the French psychoanalytic society. What would you call it? Yiddish land psycho, you know, the, there's no country that they could come from. On the other hand, they're everywhere. You know, how many psychoanalysts had Yiddish as their native tongue that, that 
started psychoanalysis in Peru or in New York or not only that this this way so so Yiddish has this very interesting status in the history of psychoanalysis as this barely exists and everywhere um, you could call it the unconscious the unconscious of psychoanalysis right I mean that's what Weinreich thought in some way I mean he didn't exactly say it but he said the, something a little bit opposite but it works right if yeah if Yiddish is a psychoanalysis if Yiddish is the unconscious of American Eastern European Jews it's also the unconscious of Freud whose ancestors were similarly Yiddish speaking Eastern European Jews which is to say that if psychoanalysis has an unconscious that unconscious dreams in Yiddish Any other? Yeah. Um, the answer to this might just be no, but I, I was curious. Um, uh, Abigail Gilman talks about um, Bertha Pappenheim in her book on uh, uh, German Jewish Bible translation. And I think she says that Bertha Pappenheim was actually Anna O from the case study. And I Absolutely. So I was just curious. This seems like an interesting, because she goes on to translate the Yiddish Women's Bible. I Crazy, was wondering, right? Yeah, if, if there is any place in which she pops up in these like Yiddish discourses about psychoanalysis? I have a chapter on her. Okay. Okay, how could I not? Okay. Anna O is patient zero. And what are, her, what are her symptoms? She has paralysis of the right hand, which seems to be, along with diabetes, something that happens to Jews in those days. Um, and a paralysis, a psychic, a psychological paralysis, which the way uh, Freud had to learn to distinguish it, and, it's like a, a paralysis, the hand, there's no such neurological thing, right? So it's, a hand is a linguistic thing. Like we have a hand only because we're uh, animals who speak. Um, the nerves don't end at the wrist. Um, she has paralysis of the hand and she has aphasia. She, can, she stops being able to speak. Her German deteriorates into a welter of languages and actually, Breuer, when he describes her problems, he says she spoke jargon, which is a synonym for Yiddish back then, because they didn't believe it was a real language. Um, and, uh, and by the way, right hand and aphasia, im eshkachech yerushalayim tishkachi mini tibak l'chiki. She also has a problem that's mentioned in the book, of, in, in, in the Psalms. Um, if I forget the O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning, may my tongue cleave to the tongue. She had it all. She looked in the Bible and got her symptoms. Um, she stopped being able to pray, it was another symptom. So um, she never got cured by psychoanalysis. Ab Kahan was right that it's not really, uh, no. Um, but she became a feminist. And she became, and what did she do? Oh, and they say she stops being able to speak German and she can only speak other languages. And what could she speak? English, Italian, French. They don't mention Yiddish because they don't think it's a language. They think it's just blah. So um, she becomes a feminist and somehow she is cured and she becomes a Yiddish translator. And I found this passage in her diary, right? She translates the Tenorena. And she's very clear that it's a therapeutic enterprise for German Jews to remember what their ancestors read in Yiddish. So she herself is a kind of feminist, Yiddishist translator. She's teaching at the Lair House. She's, she's teaching Glickel, her own ancestor. Um, and at one point, she's, she's also a crusader on behalf of, um, against sex traffic. At one point, she's writing um, she meets Alexander Rebbe to tell him about the, the terrible plague of prostitution among Hasidic girls in Poland. And he piously turns his back to her because he doesn't look at women. And she says, I've written about this. And he says, please let me see. So she stays up all that night translating her German report on prostitution in Galicia into Yiddish for the Alexander Rebbe. So she's not just translating from Yiddish into German. She's also translating from German into Yiddish, which is a lot harder. And she says, and my right hand really hurt because I was up all night writing. I do not know what to do with that, but <laughs> it gave me a chill when I read that. It's like, uh-oh. One, uh -oh. one yeah. more. One more. Yes. 
So um, when you were talking about Freud's relationship to Judaism somewhat uh, and the Jewish community, that it reminded me of some things I read quite some time ago, and I happened to Google it while you were talking. That's okay with you. <laughs> but uh, Freud had a long relationship with the Nate Brith, the premier Jewish organization of the 20th century. And, uh, and he often reflected back on why that was, and apparently because B'nai Brith, he felt in his early years that he was so isolated in the academic world, but B'nai Brith gave him an early opportunity to present his ideas at B'nai Brith Lodge meetings and other and he other, gave his uh, first public together. lectures on psychoanalysis to B'nai B'rith. Yeah. He and says his B'nai B'rith brothers heard yeah. his thoughts first. And, and I, I found a quote while you were talking uh, out of a B'nai B'rith um, gathering in, his, in honor of his 70th birthday where Freud wrote, I would, uh, because I was a Jew, I found myself free from many prejudices that hampered others in the use of their intellects. And as a Jew, I was prepared to take my place on the side of the opposition and renounce being on good terms with the compact majority. And I think that in itself is such a Freudian way of expressing things. Yeah. I, I, I really found that his perspective in that regard was so interesting. Yeah, one of the things I say is that lest you think that Freud was a cosmopolitan guy who didn't want to hang out with too many, I mean, he did have a little problem with hanging out just with Jews, whereas Yiddish, that was a little corner of the world, Freud gave his first lectures of psychoanalysis to his B'nai B'rith brothers, and Weinrach studied psychoanalysis at Yale, and in his class were students from, to get back to your question, um, Chile, um, Japan, um, Norway, I'm forgetting, 14 different countries were in that seminar on uh, culture and personality was what the seminar was called. So it was Yiddish that was the cosmopolitan uh, field in, 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 during those years. Bravissimo. Thank you.